One of the great achievements of the Emperor Augustus is his ability to create a structure that preserved much of the same basic ideas of the Republic while creating a new sense of security through his position as the sole individual who guaranteed the rights, properties, and protections of Roman citizens. It's interesting that the definition of a republic that Cicero gives in the 50s BC can, to a degree, allow us to also understand why the empire and the structure of Roman society with an emperor in charge is something that actually works in a fashion that could perhaps continue to be seen by Romans as a version of their republic. What Cicero does here is he gives, of course, as we've seen multiple times, a definition of the Republic as the possession of a group of people who are assembled around a consensus about law and the common good. Now, what Augustus is able to do is create a structure where there is genuinely a consensus about law and the common good that says Augustus should be in charge of these things. And so what we have then is a republic of a sort. Now, is it a representative democracy? This is a really legitimate question. Um, because I think to Romans, what they would say is on some level, yes, it is. It is a, a representative democracy. Um, but it's not the representative democracy we had before. Now, it's important to understand that for a representative democracy like the Roman Republic, Romans understood throughout that the equality that they were guaranteed was in these sorts of rights and protections that the state gave them as citizens. What they were not guaranteed was an equal decision-making voice uh, for everybody in the Roman society. Certain people mattered more, and certain people were more likely to make decisions, and Romans were okay with this, because the representative democracy involved an outsourcing of actual decision-making to people chosen by the Roman people. And their empire was, on some level, basically this same thing. The people bestowed, through various enterprises and actions, uh, and through their representatives, power on an emperor. And the reason this worked is because of the way Tacitus describes this. What Tacitus says is, at the end of the reign of Augustus, at home, everything was tranquil. There were magistrates with the same title, and there was a younger generation that had sprung up since the victory of Actium, and even many of the older men had been born during the civil wars. How few were left who had seen the Republic? And what Tacitus is doing here is interesting. Officially, the Republic still exists. Tacitus is writing in the early 100s. Um, officially, the Republic still exists. But effectively, by the time Tacitus is writing, the, the sort of free society of the Republic actually hadn't existed for 150 years. Instead, you had an emperor who was in charge. Now, what Tacitus is also saying is quite interesting. Augustus lived to be 76 years old. He was born in 63 BC. So he's born in the year that the Catalinarian conspiracy erupts. He's born in the year that Pompey completes his conquest of the Eastern Mediterranean. He's born uh, at the time when one could last perhaps see the Republic functioning um, in a uniform way. Augustus as a child, lived through the 50s when political chaos and violence was so great that um, there were years when the consular vote could not even be held. Uh, and then Augustus, of course, is 19 years old at the assassination of Julius Caesar. His entire adult life consisted of living either during civil wars or living during his principate, and he died at 76. There are very, very few Romans who were older than Augustus at the time that Augustus died. And so their memory of a functional republic basically does not and, and is not there for people to draw upon. Um, what they remember instead is Augustus's republic, this republic where one person is persistently guaranteeing the security and the rights of Roman citizens, and he does a good job. That's what Tacitus is emphasizing here. And so with Augustus, there is a new kind of power relationship that evolves and generates a, a system, um, a system that is the, the Republic of the Emperors. 
Uh, and what we see is this is a system that is incredibly strong and works incredibly well for the better part of over 200 years. Um, but the difference between the republic run by emperors and the actual Roman Republic is significant because in the Republic, power was something that people competed to earn. In the empire, power was something that was distributed and, and generated out by one person at the center. This was the emperor. And the emperor was the person who had the most authority in the Roman state. And this is especially true of Julio-Claudian emperors, the source of the people in the dynasty that followed Augustus. And what we see is uh, people accepted that this system should exist, but there remained considerable negotiation about how it could actually function and how it could function in a way that gave meaningful participation to Roman citizens. So... Um, it's important, I think, to, to step back and look at what is this system that Augustus creates. And so there are a few aspects of this that are important to understand. First, the restoration of the Republic. What Augustus actually does is uh, he restores senatorial offices. He allows the offices that had existed for the better part of um, you know, 400 to 500 years, depending on the office itself, to continue. Uh, people who were of elite families could continue to earn the offices that their ancestors held. Um, and so they could continue to acquire the honor that they expected to have. And this is, of course, the cursus sonorum is literally the path of honors. Uh, this continues. Uh, but actual power and actual decision making is concentrated in the hand of the princeps. But what Augustus is also very willing to do is serve effectively as the final voice in decision making or the person who steps in when there's a problem. But most of the time, senators did actually make decisions um, and government officials did actually make decisions. Augustus didn't micromanage them, though he would crack down very heavily if they did something that uh, threatened his power or looked like it was sedition. In provinces, the provinces with armies are administered by, by officers who are appointed by the emperor. And the provinces without armies, Augustus allows the Senate to choose the governors. And so again, what you have are senators who go out and administer provinces just as they had done in the empire or in the Republic. But in the empire, these people are now answerable to the emperor. And so one of the significant things that we have um, that results from this is actually now provincials have a legitimate mechanism to complain about misconduct by their governors. We think back to the Republic and what we see are senatorial governors could and did really exploit their position as governor of a province to seize resources and to, make, and to enrich themselves. Now provinces have a recourse. They can appeal to the emperor and the emperor has an incentive to be sure that they are happy because the emperor is there for life. If provincials become increasingly disenchanted with him, that threatens his power. Another aspect of this that's really important to understand about the Augustan system is there are two separate budgets. One of them is public, um, and this is the budget that's paid for by taxes and other sorts of things. Uh, and it's a budget that is always teetering very close to catastrophe. The things that Roman citizens expected of their government and the things that the government had the money to do were very precariously balanced. The other budget is the emperor's personal resources. So the emperor has charge of both of these things. He manages public funds, but he also has vast personal resources. And these include, for example, the resources that come out of Egypt, among other things. What Augustus understands is the fact that the public, se the public sector's budget always is teetering close to catastrophe means that he has the selective ability to intervene in crises however he wishes, using his personal resources. And as we saw last time, the events between 23 and 19 BC show Augustus really clearly taking advantage of this. And in the Res Gestae, he emphasizes quite strongly that when he is intervening in the life of the city and the empire, he's doing it using those personal resources. Uh, and this is a real stabilizing effect. 
Because it's clear when, th- when something goes wrong, the emperor is the one who steps in and fixes it. It provides, in a sense, a sort of feedback loop that emphasizes continually to Romans why the empire is something that they should support. Now, the main challenge that Augustus faces is making this system stick after his death. Um, the system does come into effect. He manages it quite well. Um, but what we see is, you know, of course, Augustus lives for a very long time. He outlives three of his chosen successors, and he's in a sense stuck with uh, his stepson, Tiberius, as his successor, simply because he's the last of the, the group that Augustus could conceivably turn to who's left. <clears throat> but what Augustus is also very careful to do is to be sure that he's telegraphed to senators and to others how this succession will work. So when Agrippa is supposed to be Augustus's successor in the initial years of Augustus's imperial power, he has Agrippa marry his daughter. He makes it clear to everybody that Agrippa will succeed him. Um, and then when uh, he reaches the end of his life, in 70, when he's 75 years old in 13 AD, he has the Senate recognize Tiberius as fully sharing his powers. So again, there will be no succession struggle. Um, you, hear, you hear historians sometimes say that the great failure of Augustus was in not coming up with a mechanism to choose a successor. That's actually wrong. Augustus is very careful about choosing a successor. The only problem Augustus has is he outlives a number of those successors. But when he dies, it's clear to everybody that Tiberius is going to be his heir. Another aspect of this that's important um, is that Augustus makes sure in advance that the Senate understands that Tiberius should be his heir and should share in his powers so that uh, Augustus's personal property and his powers are linked in the person of Tiberius. And so when Augustus dies in 14, um, under Tiberius's direction, the Senate passes a resolution recognizing Augustus as a god, and this is Tiberius. Um, and authority for the state then passes entirely on to Tiberius. Now, Tiberius is the son of Augustus's wife, Livia, and he'd been in and out of succession arrangements, um, and he and Augustus didn't particularly get along. But Nevertheless, when Augustus runs out of other successors and he puts Tiberius in as his successors, um, he makes sure that Tiberius is summoned to Italy uh, as Augustus's final illness progresses. And he makes it very, very clear uh, in the propaganda of both emperors, they make it very, very clear the connection between Augustus and Tiberius. So what you can see here are the, the denarii issued by the two of them. So on the left is the denarius of Augustus. Uh, and then on the right is a denarius of Tiberius. <clears throat> the two men did not actually look very, very close to each other. They didn't look very similar. So there's Tiberius, there's Augustus. Um, but in the coins, which are a mechanism of political propaganda, we see that the pose is very similar. The uh, portraiture is very similar. And if you read the legend on Tiberius's coin, what you can see is it says Tiberius Caesar Divi Augustus Felis Augustus. So Tiberius's official title is Tiberius Caesar, the son of Augustus, uh, the son of the divine Augustus, and he is himself an Augustus. The connection between the Emperor Augustus and Tiberius, his successor, who also takes the term, the term Augustus, is very, very clear. And it was unmistakable to anybody. But if we look at the story that's told of how Tiberius takes power by someone like Tacitus, uh, Tacitus gives us a different view, and it's important to understand why Tiberi- why Tacitus says this. The story Tacitus gives is this. Um, when Tiberius arrived in Nola, it wasn't known whether he found Augustus alive or dead. For the house and the neighboring streets were carefully sealed by the Empress Livia's guards. At intervals, hopeful reports were published until the steps demanded by the situation had been taken. And then two pieces of news became known simultaneously. Augustus was dead and Tiberius was in in control. Now, this is a story that you probably recognize because this is a story deliberately written so that it echoes the coup by which Servius Tullius took power following the death 
of Tarquinius Priscus. Um, that story, too, involves the wife of Tarquinius Priscus uh, sending around fake reports that Tarquinius Priscus is recovering um, and maintaining these fake reports until Servius Tullius is able to seize power. And then finally they say that Tarquinius Priscus is dead and Servius Tullius is now in charge. Tacitus tells you this story because Tacitus wants you to think that Tiberius is illegitimate in the same fashion as Servius Tullius. But Tacitus is completely wrong. Um, as we saw from the coins, and as we can see from the official titles that Tiberius assumes, nobody at all would have mistaken the uh, succession arrangements, and nobody at all would have assumed that Tiberius was pulling a Servius Tullius here. Uh, but why is Tacitus then so hostile to Tiberius? Well, part of it is because under Tiberius, the emperor and the senate don't really understand how the second generation of the Roman Empire is supposed to work. Um, Augustus, of course, was a scary guy who had seized power through a brutal civil war. And the fact that he then reigned for the better part of uh, 44 years as a uh, more or less peaceful person who was not any longer engaging in massacres of his political opponents, this still didn't change the fact that he was a formidable and kind of scary figure. <clears throat> but Tiberius did not seize power violently. In fact, most of the people alive didn't actually have any memorable experience of the violent civil wars that had brought Augustus to power. And so they don't really know how to behave towards Tiberius. So what, Ta what Tacitus says is after Tiberius took power at Rome, the consuls, the senate, the knights, they all become precipitately servile. The more distinguished men were, the greater their urgency and insincerity, because they must neither show satisfaction at the death of Augustus, nor gloom at the ascension of another. And so the senators are not sure how uh, groveling they have to be to this new emperor. They're not sure if this still is the kind of republic with a figurehead um, who makes the actual decisions, but the republic still functions, uh, or if this is something a lot more like a monarchy. And so Tacitus is, is, is uh, trying to emphasize for us the challenge that everybody faces in trying to figure out the rules of what Rome is going to be like under its second emperor. So elites become really, really servile and groveling. But Tiberius uh, doesn't want this. Tiberius, Tacitus says, makes a habit of allowing the consuls the initiative in the Senate as though the Republic still existed and he himself were uncertain whether to take charge or not. Even the edict with which he summoned the Senate to its house was merely issued by virtue of his tribunician powers which he had received under Augustus. He proposed to arrange his father's last honors. This, he said, was the only state business he was assuming. <clears throat> and so what Tacitus is saying here is something that I think actually is probably true. The Senate becomes um, extremely, extremely uh, docile and willing to um, grovel before the new emperor, but Tiberius remains committed to this idea of the Republic still functioning with him as a figurehead, um, with him as a, a sort of leader who exceeds all in authority, but the Republic still functions. And so Tiberius, as his first action, is trying very desperately to make it clear to senators that yes, he actually does want the genuine functionings of Republican government beneath him. He will ultimately make the final decisions, but he also wants that structure to still exist underneath him as it had done under Augustus. Tacitus, though, is very suspicious of this uh, because Tacitus says that uh, while Tiberius is doing these kinds of things, it's also clear that Tiberius has taken control of the actual mechanisms that allow people to use force in the state. He has assumed dominance of the army, and the personal bodyguards. Uh, and so what we're told by Tacitus is even though Tiberius is remaining deferential to the Senate, when Augustus dies, Tiberius had given the watchword to the guard as its commander. He already had the trappings of a court too, such as personal bodyguard and men-at-arms. When he went to the Senate, 
or in when he went to the forum or into the senate he had soldiers escort him he sent letters to the armies as though he were already emperor he only showed signs of hesitation when he addressed the senate <clears throat> and so what tacitus is saying is that tiberius is basically playing a double game he's showing hesitation when he addresses the senate but really he seized power for himself and tacitus sees this as um, basically something that is deceitful and Tiberius will ultimately use this to suss out people who are opposed to him and, and attack them um, when they show their hands. Really though, what Tiberius is doing is he's framing his powers in much the same way that Augustus did in the Res Gestae. Um, and actually because the Res Gestae is basically contemporaneous with Tiberius seizing power, this is the model for imperial power that Romans are supposed to understand their emperors articulating. Augustus says, I transferred the Republic from my own power to the dominion of the Senate and the people of Rome. And after this time, I excelled all in influence, although I possess no more official power than the others who were my colleagues and several magistrates. This is what Tiberius is doing. He's allowing the Senate and the people to function. He's also exercising greater authority. And this is exactly what his position is supposed to be like. And so Tacitus's critique of Tiberius is genuinely unfair. Um, what Tacitus says is Tiberius did these things because he wanted to seem like the person chosen and called by the state. And afterwards, it was understood that Tiberius pretended to be hesitant for another reason, too, in order to detect what leading men were thinking. And every word, every look he twisted into some criminal significance and stored them up in his memory. <clears throat> so what Tacitus is doing is he's describing things that are legitimate. Was Tiberius deferential to the Senate? Absolutely. Was the Senate unsure about how to behave towards Tiberius? Absolutely. Are those things completely understandable? Absolutely. Because the structure that Augustus articulated and the structure that Tiberius is following is a structure that is based on a kind of ambiguity. Uh, notionally, the Republic still exists. Officers still hold offices. The Senate still meets. And the emperor, in Tiberius's case, the emperor is uh, deliberately deferential to the Senate because he values that Republican structure. But that structure is also a structure that requires someone to be in charge. Um, that's what Augustus built. The exceeding in uh, authority was a legitimate thing. Uh, the exceeding in authority was something that allowed him to control armies. It allowed him to control personal accounts. It allowed him to control resources and money. Um, this was the structure. And when Tacitus is saying that Tiberius is valuing the integrity um, and the autonomy of the Senate and things that are entrusted to the Senate, what Tacitus is doing is misreading what Tiberius is actually doing because Tiberius is trying to be true to the structures Augustus put in place. Um, but Tacitus tells other stories that try to support this image of Tiberius as a kind of conniving and manipulative person. So uh, Tacitus tells us there's a well-known story about Hatteras. Hatteras went into the palace to apologize for giving offense to Tiberius. And as Tiberius walked by, Hatteras groveled at his feet, and Tiberius then crashed to the ground, either by accident or because he was brought down by the grip of Hatterius. Hatterius was then all but killed by the guards. However, the emperor's feelings were not softened by the dangerous predicament of the senator until Hatterius appealed to the Augusta, as Livia was now called, and at her urgent entreaty, he was saved. And so what this story is supposed to show is how the misunderstood uh, intentions of Tiberius and the Senate caused really significant problems. The Senate just simply doesn't know what to make of Tiberius. They don't know what to think of the kinds of actions that he's taken that are sim simultaneously deferential to the Senate, but also uh, actions that cause him to seize control of the use of force in the state. Um, and so what you have here is, Tib is Tacitus exploiting a story that shows this ambiguity. Uh, an overly deferential Senate that antagonizes Tiberius and finds itself potentially subject to violence. This kind of understanding or this kind of misunderstanding 
is something that um, potentially could create bad relationships between the emperor and senators. And uh, ultimately, it did create bad relationships between the emperors and the senate. Uh, because the senators in practice really didn't want to rock the boat. They didn't really uh, want to challenge Tiberius's rule. They just wanted to figure out how to work alongside him. But Tiberius was the kind of person who was prickly. He didn't always communicate what he was doing exactly um, as he intended. There was significant misunderstanding about what he was actually trying to accomplish. And that misunderstanding was something that he did not have the personality to really manage very well. Um, and so the bad feelings between Tiberius and the Senate were made worse by a set of treason trials that were launched in the early 30s AD. Uh, and these began with the murder of Sejanus, a freed slave who had been very prominent in Tiberius' household, and his prominence had attracted a great deal of envy among others in Rome. Uh, and a rumor then became current that he was planning to overthrow Tiberius with the help of some um, senators. And so Sejanus was arrested. Members of his family were convinced that they needed to commit suicide. And many of his friends were then investigated. Um, and the death of Sejanus then instituted a set of treason trials uh, where basically they were charged with um, anticipating or imagining that they could do something against Tiberius, even just attacking his character. Now, our sources indicate that Tiberius used a law that was centered on something called maestas, um, which is a, a law that is about treason, but it's also a law that includes things like arrogance, um, like being sort of overly proud, uh, slandering the person in charge, or even extortion. And in the sources describing the reign of Tiberius, and, and most notably in Tacitus, the period following the death of Sejanus is portrayed as a reign of terror with many executions coming about on trumped-up charges of maestas that the emperor learns about from informers. And it was said that Rome was full of informers who were trying to get people in trouble and charged with maestas. But what we have to understand is the sources for this period are actually written much later. They're written um, by people like Tacitus and Suetonius. Uh, and the sources talking about this, generally speaking, the most um, prominent and the most sensational are sources that come from the period of the reign of Nerva and Trajan, um, a period that is beyond the scope of, of this sequence of lectures and also a, a period that uh, reflects very strongly a senatorial sensibility of what the relationship with an emperor should be. And it's not the sensibility of the 30s AD, it's the sensibility of the 100s AD. <clears throat> and the reality seems to be far different from the world Tacitus in Tacitus describes, because Tiberius genuinely did believe that the basic protections and due process that the Republic and the Roman state in general extended to Roman citizens needed to be observed and protected. So after the death of Sejanus, 106 people are charged with maestas. Of those 106, only 35 are convicted of, every, of anything. That's one out of every three. This is hardly a reign of terror, and the convictions were done according to due process. This was an action and a set of actions that very much still respected the basic rights and privileges of Roman citizens. Um, and the informers who gave false information against Roman citizens are also published punished quite severely. And so what we see is Tiberius is working very hard to maintain that basic principle that the Roman state had guaranteed for Romans from the beginning. Um, this idea that Romans all have certain rights that the state must observe, certain rights to due process that the state must follow. And Tiberius, even though Tacitus describes this as a reign of terror, Tiberius is very clear that he's observing those principles. Um, and so is this a tyrannical moment in the Roman state? I think it's very hard to say that. Um, is this a moment where the conception of the Republic that Cicero lays out is broken? I think, again, it's very hard to say that because the idea about law, the, the idea of maestas was a Roman concept that went back to the Republic. It's something that Tiberius is applying in this context but he's using due process that, again, is consistent with the structures that Romans came to expect. Um, and we're also, it's also very clear from our sources 
The Tiberius permitted dissent. Um, those unhappy with the political situation could either retire from political life or they could criticize him. And Tiberius very clearly permitted freedom of discussion in the Senate. And on one occasion, he even ended up as a minority of one, where the entire Senate voted against him when a vote was taken and Tiberius let this go forward. <clears throat> And so what we have is a very clear difference between what Tiberius is trying to do and what Tacitus is saying Tiberius actually did. And that difference is something that obscures the fact that what Tiberius is actually trying to do is still work within the context of that Augustan Republican system where an emperor is in charge. Now the problems with our sources become really pronounced when we move to the reign of Tiberius' successor, Caligula. <clears throat> Caligula's name literally means little boots, um, and this is a name he got because he went along with his father Germanicus on campaign, and while he was on campaign, he was dressed up in a little soldier's outfit and he looked really cute. And so the soldiers called him Caligula, little boots. Um, really his name and the official name that he uses on his coins and inscriptions, he's Gaius. And that's because he apparently hated the name Caligula. I uh, know when we think about Caligula, um, we have a couple of really famous literary portraits that portray Caligula as crazy. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the less well-known of them is the report from Philo. Now, we don't, now Tacitus did write about Caligula, but we don't actually have that segment of his work. Um, but the uh, most, one of the less well-known is the portrait that comes from the Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria. And Philo uh, knew Caligula, or interacted with Caligula personally, because he came to Rome following a riot that ravaged the Jewish community in the city of Alexandria, and he asked Caligula for an assurance of imperial support for the Jewish community. And Philo says that Caligula actually um, made him wait in Rome for a very long time, and then finally held the meetings with him on the grounds of a villa that Caligula was constructing. And so Caligula showed Philo around the villa, um, apparently paid no attention to what Philo was saying about the situation in Alexandria. And then finally he turns and he asks Philo, kind of prompted, uh, unprompted and out of nowhere, um, about Jewish kosher laws and why it was that the Jews were so weird and have such strange dietary habits. The intimation that, that Philo is giving is that Caligula was unbalanced um, and incapable of actually running the empire well. Now, Suetonius has a much more elaborate portrait of Caligula, and his stories range from Caligula having incestuous relationships with his sister to arranging for his horse to be made consul. But the best, um, at least my favorite story, is the uh, campaign that, that Caligula was going to launch to take Britain. Now, he didn't have the money to do this. Um, and so we're told by Suetonius, or we're told uh, that he marshals the soldiers on the shore, and when they're getting ready to launch the invasion, he then just orders them to collect the seashells. Um, and the idea again is Caligula is uh, unstable. <clears throat> and Suetonius finishes his account of Caligula by describing Caligula's murder. And this is a scene that actually the uh, French philosopher Albert Camus uses to great effect. Um, Suetonius describes Caligula being stabbed and calling out while he's being stabbed, I'm still alive. And for Camus, this becomes a kind of metaphor for a life that a life lived by someone who recognizes the absurdity of the kinds of pursuits that regular people engage in. Um, it is clear, though, that with Caligula, we have a very serious historical problem. Because our sources present him as unbalanced, uniquely so. That's why Camus is able to seize on Caligula as an example of, of this kind of absurdist way of thinking. And it's quite possible that our sources that describe him this way are right. But there are things we should be skeptical, skeptical about in some aspects of these portraits. So in Suetonius' portrait, for example, Suetonius describes his extravagance. And he says, no one can parallel Gaius' far-fetched extravagances. He invented new kinds of baths and the most unnatural dishes and drinks, bathing in hot and cold perfume bath oils, drinking valuable pearls dissolved in vinegar, <clears throat> and providing his guests with golden bread and golden meat. And he would remark that a man must be either frugal or a Caesar, and suffice it to record that in less than a year, he squandered Tiberius's entire fortune of 27 million gold pieces. 
And so Suetonius is here implying that Caligula is wasteful, um, that he's unbalanced, that he is uh, so devoted to <clears throat> spending money for spending money's sake that he does incredibly wasteful things, uh, just simply designed to destroy objects of great value. Now, the story of dissolving pearls in vinegar is one that we've already seen. Um, remember this, the story of Aesopus, the actor, so that he could swallow a million sesterces in a single drink, dissolved in vinegar a precious pearl which he'd taken from the ear of Metella. Uh, also, Cleopatra. There have been two pearls that were the largest in the whole of history, both owned by Cleopatra, the last queen of Egypt. <clears throat> When uh, she met Antony, in accordance with previous instructions, her service, servants placed in front of her a single vessel containing vinegar, the strong, rough quality of which can melt pearls. She was in that, at that moment wearing in her ears that remarkable and truly unique work of nature. Antony was full of curiosity to see what in the world she was going to do. She took off one earring and dropped the pearl in the vinegar, and when it was melted, she swallowed it. So the story emphasizes or should emphasize how little we should believe what Suetonius has said. Um, this is just a story that's told again and again about Romans and people in the Roman orbit who are devoted to luxury. Uh, telling this story about Caligula doesn't mean he did it. Telling this story about Caligula it just means that he fits into that same category as people who were thought to be um, expending lots of money for not very good reasons. Now, how can we be critical of this? Um, what can we actually do with the facts that Suetonius gives us? <clears throat> so Suetonius gives us a bunch of things that are not really substantiated, things like uh, drinking pearls and vinegar. He gives us one fact, though, that he would have been able to substantiate. The, it, it, squandering Tiberius' entire fortune of 27 million gold pieces. Now, what is that fortune? That fortune is the private account that Tiberius left to him. Um, it's basically resources left in that private account. So what happened to it, really? <clears throat> well, Suetonius actually gives us a clue of what happens to that 27 million gold pieces um, in Tiberius's private account. Caligula, when he took power, abolished the Italian half percent auction tax and paid compensation to a great many people whose houses had been damaged by fire. Any king whom he had restored to the throne was awarded the arrears of taxes and revenues that had accumulated since his deposition. So Antiochus of Comagene, for example, got a refund of a million gold pieces. That refund is, of course, one twenty-seventh of all of the money that Caligula inherited from Tiberius. Um, abolishing the half percent auction tax. That half percent auction tax was used to pay for the retirement uh, funds for Roman soldiers. Paying that compensation, that was also a significant amount of money. So where did Caligula's 27 million gold piece surplus go? It went to paying for these kinds of things. I mean, it went for policy, for paying for policies that Caligula sponsored. And none of these things that must be emphasized were paid for out of the state budget. These kinds of things would be paid for because they were cost overruns out of the private budget. And so Caligula did certainly exhaust the 27 million gold piece surplus, but he exhausted it by pursuing policy aims. Um, and so it's clear also why he would do this. When a new emperor takes power, he needs to build support. He needs to build support among Roman citizens. He also needs to build support among subjects and clients of the Roman state. That's what these measures are doing. It's tax reduction, um, it's increased spending, and it's foreign aid. Um, and we know in a modern context what happens to budgets when you redu reduce taxes, increase expenditures, um, and give a lot of money to people uh, in other countries you get a deficit. And that's what Caligula did, and that's what he needed to offset by using those resources in the private accounts that he inherited from Tiberius. <clears throat> but it's also clear that, Tiber that Caligula was not a very successful figure. And by the end of his reign, he was not a terribly popular one either. Um, he was assassinated after only four years. So uh, this is actually something we have to appreciate from the Roman perspective. 
Augustus reigned for 44 years as emperor. Tiberius reigned for, 20, uh, for 23 years as emperor. Caligula reigned for four. <clears throat> and he was the first emperor to not die of natural causes. So this was profoundly shocking for Romans, and they didn't really know how to react. Um, now, Caligula was succeeded by his uncle Claudius, um, and after his death, Caligula was given something called Domnatio Memoriae. And this required the erasing of representations of the emperor and his name. And so Caligula's portraits were taken down, um, on painted things, his face was actually erased. Uh, his inscriptions also had their names erased. And so this gives you a sense of how Domnatio Memoriae worked. Um, the most comprehensive example of Domnatio Memoriae was done to the Emperor Gita by his brother Caracalla in uh, the early third century. And um, this is the only surviving painted portrait of an imperial uh, family from that survives from antiquity. And it's actually one where you can see the Domnatio Memoria. So you see Septimius Severus, uh, his wife, Julia Domna. On the bottom, you see Caracalla, and then you see the face of somebody that's been wiped out. That's Gita. What's interesting is the uh, people, um, scholars have examined what the wiping out was actually done with. It turns out it was done with elephant dung. Uh, and so this is a sort of significant ceremonial thing where Gita is not forgotten. His memory is condemned so that you remember that he has been condemned. Um, this portrait was not taken down. It was left up with Gita effaced. Also, what we see here uh, in Damnatio Memoriae of Gita on inscriptions. So the one on the left comes from, um, from Serbia. Uh, and you can see the list here. This is actually the same basic uh, titles of the emperors in Greek and in Latin. On the Latin side, you see um, that this is an altar that is for the health of uh, the emperor Septimius Severus and his son, Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, that's uh, Caracalla. And then you have this line that's erased, that's Gita. Similarly, you can see here, um, this is erected to the honor of Se Severus Septimius, um, the emperor, and Marcus Antonius, that's Caracalla, and then this erased stuff is Gita. Um, with Caligula, we have less examples of the destruction of his portraits and uh, his names than we do um, for Gita, but what we also see are some interesting things where portraits of Caligula seem to have been um, thrown away, and so you see here the portrait has extensive root marks um, because this was thrown underground and a tree and plants grew on top of it. Uh, what we also can see sometimes with portraits of Caligula is that they get recarved into other people. Uh, and so they get you know, put in a storehouse and then people use them and they recarve them. And you can see kind of along the head here, uh, you can see that the hairline looks almost like it hits a cliff and it gets kind of indented. This is maybe indication of a portrait being recarved. <clears throat> now, Damnatio Memoriae is a way of making sure that people remembered how bad someone was. Um, if your face is scratched out, for example, everyone who sees that image with your face scratched out remembers you. They remember how bad you were. And so this becomes an important weapon for senatorial opponents to use against emperors they dislike. Now, Caligula is succeeded by Claudius, uh, and Claudius reigns from 41 to 54 AD. Claudius did not ever expect to be emperor. Claudius was instead a scholar. We saw him earlier um, in the discussion of um, the pre prior life of uh, Servius Tellius. Claudius was a scholar of Etruscan antiquity, among other things. Um, he also was not the most socially dignified person. Uh, he was seen as kind of socially awkward. And when Caligula was killed, Claudius was found hiding behind the curtains in the imperial palace, and the Praetorian guards moved him forward simply because he was of the imperial family uh, and he wasn't particularly objectionable. <clears throat> but Claudius did accomplish some important things. Um, one of them is the conquest of Britain. Um, but even more interesting is a, an action that he takes to expand the ranks of the Senate. 
And so this is the Tablet of Leon. We've seen this before. Um, but this is a very interesting document because it, it conveys uh, and, and captures a discussion in the Senate that we also have from Tacitus. And it's a discussion where, Cla where Claudius comes before the Senate and he basically says, I want to extend senator the I want to open the Senate to highborn gentlemen who come from northern areas of Gaul. And what we see from both the um, Tablet of Leon and Tacitus' description of this is there's actually some reaction against this in the Senate. And what Claudius basically has to say is, um, we need to do this. We should have no regrets in extending the membership of the Senate all the way up to what's now Lyon, because it's not without some hesitation across the limits of provinces, but the moment has come where I must plead openly for the cause of further Gaul, because in the spirit, and this is where Servius Tullius becomes relevant, in the spirit of Rome, incorporation of leading people makes us better. Incorporation of people from outside of the established ranks of the Roman aristocracy makes Rome stronger. And so we saw earlier that Claudius brings in the example of Servius Tullius to talk about how, in the past, Rome has incorporated people because those people have something to generate that's positive. They make Rome better because they join the polity. And they join the polity not as the lowest members of that society, but as really important and prominent people in leadership roles. Claudius is saying we need to do the same for Gauls. <clears throat> and so when we are uh, looking at this and when we are thinking about what the Julio-Claudian dynasty comes to embody, it's this balance between the republic that Augustus creates, a republic that functions with leading people um, still occupying roles where they have real significant uh, activities that they take to make sure the Roman state is successful, but they do it under the complete understanding, with the complete understanding, that the emperor in charge exceeds them in authority and has a monopoly over the use of violence. But they work collaboratively. And the emperor, for his part, um, works when the state fails, when the public accounts are not enough, when there are problems, the emperor works by intervening when senatorial leadership fails. Um, but the emperor, of course, also is responsible for maintaining peace and prosperity. With that, though, is a basic understanding by these emperors that the state succeeds and must succeed by first of all recognizing the basic rights that Roman citizens have, providing them with due process, and, uh, and this is crucial, continuing that process that Rome has done for a very long time of continually integrating people who are important and have something to offer the Roman state at the highest levels, extending citizenship to people who merit citizenship, but also extending opportunities to serve in the Senate uh, and to participate in the government of the Roman state to individuals who have the capacity to do that well. This is what the Julio-Claudian dynasty through the reign of Claudius is building. A stable Roman structure with an emperor guaranteeing that stability and prosperity, and also a commitment to inclusion to bring people from the subject ranks of the Roman Empire into the Roman citizen body and ultimately into the Roman ruling class. This is a really important balancing act, but it's one that um, is very successful in large part because it's also very much consistent with how Rome as a polity has worked in the past. And so you now have an emperor, not a republic, just like you once had a republic and not a king. But in each of those aspects of the Roman constitution, in each of those aspects of the evolution of the Roman state, there is a set of basic commitments that are retained. And this is why you can have revolutions in who exercises power without fundamentally shifting the way that those in power interact with the people who are their fellow citizens.